So the first scripture lesson we heard today came from a gospel parable, a story about bridesmaids who some were ready and some were less ready for the events that unfolded around them at times they couldn't foresee in advance. Um, it's a very timely message about preparations and expectancy uh, given the events of the past week. I can honestly say that the current sermon went through three different forms between last week and today. But we're going to turn our hearts now to another scripture reading, and this actually comes from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew. But let's first prepare our hearts with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, draw near to us. Surround us once more with your comfort, with your encouragement, but also with your zeal, that all that we do may reflect your will for our lives and for this world. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the reading for today comes from the very last chapter of the book of Joshua. Joshua is an important book because you have the first five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch, but Moses dies at the end of the fifth book, and the people of Israel are only brought into the land of promise by Moses' successor, Joshua. And so his book is sometimes seen as the critical sixth book in the story of the people of Israel. And this is the last chapter from that book, the culmination of this commitment to faith led by Joshua. So listen to this reading, and it's a longer reading from chapter 24, verses 1 to 3 and 14 to 25. Joshua then gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, the officers of Israel and they presented themselves to God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates, and they served other gods. So then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord. Serve God in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land where you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered Joshua, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It is the Lord, our God, who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, who did these great signs in our sight. God protected us all the way, all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, who is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, who is a holy God. The Lord is a jealous God, who will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then God will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve God. And they said, Yes, we are witnesses. So Joshua said to them, Put away then the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God, we will serve and we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them there at Shechem. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
There's actually a very easy message that could be spoken this morning to you. There's a message that I know will fall largely on sympathetic ears. A message of this day being able to breathe again, to believe again, and to hope again. A celebratory message about a historic election, about a new president-elect, and about the first woman, the first woman of color as vice president-elect. It's a message about resilience, about black women persevering, about women of color fighting for change, about young people working for justice, about people in Pennsylvania believing in their better angels and trusting that tomorrow can be a better day. On Saturday, there was dancing in Squirrel Hill, on Carson Street, in Oakland, and downtown. And I don't want to take away anything from any of that, any of that historic, amazing, powerful moment. But an easy message is not a sermon. I watched MSNBC and ABC and Fox News last night, as did many of you. I scrolled through Facebook and Instagram and Google last night, as did many of you. And the word for this morning builds upon some of what we heard spoken yesterday and relies on some of the images that we saw this past week. But the focus of this sermon is not on last Tuesday or even last night. The focus is on this moment, this the Lord's day, and what tomorrow means for us. And our conversation partner this morning is not Kamala or Joe, but rather it's Joshua. So let's begin with a reality check. Despite all the media fuss and hand-wringing over this election, the truth is that nothing has fundamentally changed in America. Ours is a nation of tremendous resources, a nation able to meet everyone's needs if we manage them generously and justly. Ours is a land of amazing beauty that we're called to preserve and protect diligently. But conversely, ours is also a country where there is racial strife and economic inequality where there's drug addiction and health care discrepancies that touch literally every family one way or another. Now, this good news, bad news type realities are not going away except through concentrated, dedicated, and faithful action from every one of us from right here in Pittsburgh all the way to the White House. See, we find ourselves in what I would characterize as a Joshua moment, a moment that requires us to focus, to take a deep breath, and to consciously choose whom we will follow from this day forth. All of our lives are full of turning points. Now, some of those turning points are negative ones, midlife crises, losing a job, perhaps facing a divorce. Other turning points are more positive. Heading off to college for the first time, celebrating a new marriage or the birth of a child, or a promotion in a career that truly energizes us. But at every turning point of our life, the same sky is above us, the same ground is below us, the same person looks back at us when we gaze into the mirror. All that is different is that for that moment we stand at a crossroad. Our foot is literally poised, raised in the air. And in that moment, we consciously, intentionally decide in which direction we're going to step forward. It's in those moments that we hear a voice saying to us, choose what's important to you. Choose now what gives your life meaning, what makes sense for you and sense for all those that you love. That's why these are Joshua moments, because it's literally in these moments the voice says to us, choose this day whom you will serve, and choose who 
is your God. Joshua spoke those words a long time ago back in the Shechem Valley. Around him were people who had traced their roots back to Abraham and Sarah of old, who had endured generations of slavery in Egypt, but who now stood literally on the cusp of freedom. There they were, the 12 tribes of Joseph and Jacob and Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin and all the others. And they stood there before Joshua hopeful, yet also flawed. They had a long history of worshiping false idols, of breaking the commandments, of grumbling against God even as they wandered in the wilderness toward a land of promise. But on this day they stood there once more and they were asked again to love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul and all their strength. And honestly, aren't things much the same today? Now we're not standing in the Shechem Valley, but we're standing in the Mon Valley, where people of Allegheny County, but also people of Beaver and Butler and Westmoreland and Fayette counties, where people of Pennsylvania, but also of West Virginia, of Ohio and New York and Texas and Alabama and all 50 tribes of America. Joshua didn't mince words. He told the people, and he tells us, your first task is to unpack your baggage. And so we do that proudly, looking at our American heritage, a nation with a democratic constitution and a bill of rights, a nation with a long history of, of working for innovation, of showing generosity, of offering global leadership. But as we unpack all the things we carry with us, we also see the false idols of our past. The slave trading that dates back to 1619. The crumbled treaties made and broken with Native American peoples. We see the carefully folded clan robes. The old sign saying, no Irish need apply. No votes for women. Immigrants go home. We see the county maps designating Japanese internment camps. We see the photos of a burning Cuyahoga River the warning signs near Love Canal or Three Mile Island. But even as we unpack all those things and lay them out before us, Joshua doesn't let us stop there. Joshua persists and says, empty your pockets, empty your wallets. And in that moment, we clearly see the idols that we still carry with us. The smartphones that are linked to social media platforms designed to reinforce ultimately what we already believe and to denigrate other perspectives. The political language that comes too often from both sides that treats any contrary and opposing news as fake and not to be trusted. The lifestyle enclaves we build up around us and isolate ourselves within. Not to mention the prisons we fill, the schools we underfund, the social services we scale back, the long-term goals we ignore in this I-need-it-now culture of today. I read recently about a sociology experiment done by a Harvard professor about 20 years ago, a man named Robert Sampson. And it was a study done to measure the vitality of different urban neighborhoods. And in this study, what Samson did was he stamped and addressed thousands of envelopes. And then he carefully scattered them on the sidewalks of a major U.S. urban city. Now, he also took note of the neighborhoods, checking to see which had businesses that were open or were boarded up, which had sidewalks with litter and broken windows nearby, or had clean curbings and neat plantings. And then he measured which letters were actually picked up and mailed back to him. He documented which neighborhoods were willing to take that step and to retrieve a lost letter, and which ones were quite comfortable allowing the envelope to be trampled underfoot and left behind, discarded, crumpled on the ground. Samson's study measured something 
that he named moral cynicism. This idea that somehow governments are fundamentally not to be trusted, that laws and common courtesies are not binding on any of us, and that small acts of kindness are simply not worth the effort. Which begs the question, what sort of God are we following when simple courtesy no longer matters and that we cynically believe that our connection to our neighbors no longer has to guide our daily behavior? So on that day long ago in Shechem, Joshua shouted to the crowd, if you're not willing to follow God, then choose this day whom you will serve, but for me and for my family, we will serve the Lord. And the people of Shechem were a bit abashed, and they quickly said, no, no, of course. Of course we'll follow God and serve the Lord. But Joshua gave them a stern word of warning. He said, no, you cannot serve God the Lord, for God is a jealous God. Or perhaps a better translation, God is a zealous God. God who asks of you a deep commitment to justice and the law and righteousness. And this was a pivotal moment for the people then, a turning point in their lives. But that moment only worked if they honestly emptied their baggage and set aside the idols both old and new, put aside false gods, and set to aside moral cynicism. Only then could the people look back to Joshua and say, yes, it is God alone whom we will serve and obey. So the question is, what does this Joshua moment mean for us today, both as a nation and as individuals? The more I thought about this, I realized that what is needed this morning is not Baptist fire and Pentecostal fervor or rabble-rousing rhetoric, which is a blessing because my Kansas upbringing is far short of all of those resources. But as I said earlier, the reality is that nothing has fundamentally changed in America. The biologist Hope Jaron says that ultimately we are all only given four resources, the earth, the sky, the oceans, and one another. On this day there are blue skies above us, there are trees with autumn leaves around us, there are lawns that need to be raked below our shoes. On this day there is still racism and poverty There's a dangerous pandemic. There's economic uncertainty. There are personal fears and there are very real anxieties and all of them need and deserve our sustained attention. And so Joshua asks us, choose this day whom you will serve. And perhaps too quickly we want to respond, well, of course, we will serve God. But Joshua talks to us and argues and warns and says, you need to mean what you say and say what you mean. And so chastened, we unpack, we reflect, and then we reply again, we will serve the Lord. And to emphasize those words, we go even further. We too say, We are witnesses. Hold us to these words. Hold us to this commitment. Tell it to our children that we will serve God alone. And it's at this point that Joshua then graciously ends the conversation with just one admonition. He says, friends, then put aside the idols that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord. In effect, Joshua tells it to us straight. Joshua says, no, you have not been served well by the false gods of your past, by your prejudices, by your pocket-sized idols, by easy, self-serving answers. So step away from them. And instead, look to the sky, look to the ocean, look to the earth, and look to one another. 
And as you do so, look to the horizon just beyond you and then breathe and take in the zeal of the Lord who loves you unconditionally. And to do that is simple. He says, incline your hearts to the Lord. In this 2020 Joshua moment, we are called to consciously, humbly open ourselves to the grace that defeats all moral cynicism, and to the compassion that seeks every lost lamb in every nation. We're called to incline ourselves, to trust ourselves to the God whose love will never let you go, ever. In John chapter 6, Jesus had been preaching and teaching, but he'd done it so forcibly that he had managed to offend many people. And many of his followers suddenly abandoned him. In that moment, Jesus, seeing this, he turned to the 12 disciples nearby and he said, do you also wish to go away? And in response, Peter, good old Simon Peter, said to him, Lord, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. In this American Joshua moment, in this personal Joshua moment, look around. There is work to be done. There are wrongs to be righted. There are wounds to be dressed. There are hands to be extended across divides. There is damage to be repaired for the sake of our children and our children's children. All other pathways we might seek this day are dead ends. All other priorities are little more than cheap idols. So choose this day the one whose words lead to life and life eternal. Incline your hearts to God. And let us look forward, let us look to walk forward by faith together. May all God's people say, Amen.